throughout the course of the summer, we have been spending and will continue to spend some time in the book of Ephesians. And, and I kind of encourage a lot of you just to have a devotional time in the book of Ephesians because it's a great book, book for spiritual growth in our lives. And, and next week, uh, all the pastors are going to be leaving for our national convention, convention down in Orlando at our, uh, to kind of vote on various things. And uh, so we're going to be gone for all the week and then come back next, next weekend. But uh, one of our elders, Craig Menick, will be preaching on that uh, next sun, this next Sunday. And he's taking um, the, uh, his reference from the, the book of Revelation, which is the, the letter to the church at Ephesus. And it, in that letter, it talks about, you know, keeping your first love your first love. So uh, being persevering and prioritizing in your life. So it's going to be a great one. And then later in the summer, some of the other sermons also will be dedicated to that. Today, to the, the title of today's sermon, Stand Firm. We've been in a sit, walk, stand series these uh, last three weeks. And uh, we first started talking about sitting in the presence of God, that, that we, we need to understand our position in Christ, that we are seated with him in the heavenlies at the right hand of the throne of God, that in Christ we have a new identity, the old things have passed away, new things have come, and that we've been given all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, and how important it is for us all to sit at the feet of Christ and learn from him and that's not just in quiet time, that's wherever we are uh, 24-7. Last week we talked about how to walk out our faith in the world, not according to the devil, not according to the way everybody else lives life, but according to the way Christ wants us to live, living life, uh, walking carefully, lovingly, as children of light, filled with the Holy Spirit moment by moment. This morning we're going to be dealing with the passage in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and let's just stand together as we read God's Word. This is the Word of the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish the, all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit with this in view. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. <clears throat> I know, and I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is certainly some man verses, isn't it? You know, I, I don't know where there's more man verses in the Bible than in this particular passage that I've been reading. You know, the imagery of the Roman soldier, which, of course, in that time, everyone would have known what a Roman soldier was like as they were throughout the world, dominating the world. And, and the Roman armor was always very important and, and actually was one of the reasons the Romans were so successful at taking over the world. They had good armor that protected them, while other nations had no armor in, in many cases. So they had that good armor. The words are strong when we talk about strong and the strength of his might. And, and he talks about this cosmic battle 
that's going on in heavenly places. He mentions how we need to stand firm three times in our resistance to the evil spiritual powers of the devil and his demons. You know, really, truly, the human race has not been too good at fighting the devil, have we, since the fall in the Garden of Eden. In a world, we have an unseen enemy. Some people, on the one hand, deny that he ever exists, and on the other hand, some people do believe that the devil is everywhere. And I remember going through a, with a group of my charismatic brothers one time, and they were trying to cast the demon of a bad knee out of a guy. And I said, no, this is, there's not such a thing as a demon of a bad knee. And so you know how it goes sometimes. People go overboard uh, in, in their references to the devil and to the power that the devil really has because the power has no power compared to God himself. And, uh, but you know, as we speak on, on the devil in the day and age in which we live, and obviously we have a highly educated congregation Sometimes it, it seems like we're a throwback to the dark ages or something when we talk about these, these demons. Uh, and if you talk about it sincerely, uh, that we have a battle going on around us in the form of evil and the forces of good, uh, it seems like kind of an exaggeration. But I think it was about four years ago now that Jim, in his uh, going through the Gospel of Luke, had a sermon dedicated to this and uh, reminded us that the Bible actually speaks a lot about this battle between God, Satan, and demonic forces. The, the battle starts, as we know, in Genesis, the temptation in Adam and Eve, and they fell, fell in the temptation, and through that, we all experience death, spiritual separation from God. We see devil, the devil telling God, the only reason Job follows you is because of all the blessings. If he were afflicted, he would leave you. And God, of course, gives Satan permission to test Job. We see the demonic uh, work in Israel's first king, Saul. Actually, demons are mentioned in that one. And then we see the work of the devil in King David as such a forthright king falling in the temptation with another man's wife. The devil has many names. The tempter, the worthless one, the accuser, the angel, an angel of light, a roaring lion, the prosecuting attorney, the hostile one. His schemes are many, trickery, subterfuge, evil, temptation, baiting, Lying, he appears as an angel of light. He's attractive, desirable, seems perfectly legitimate, but is a camouflage trap. We see the devil is very active in the New Testament, beginning with Jesus in the wilderness, being tempted uh, three times uh, by the devil. Jesus, of course, rebukes the devil with the use of Scripture, saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so when we're encountering spiritual <clears throat> forces of evil, one of the key antidotes is the Word of God. So remember that, that Scripture is so important in, in fighting the devil. We also learn even that after that time, in the last words that were said in that appearance of the devil uh, with Jesus in the wilderness, the confrontation ended and the devil would be waiting for a more opportune time to hit Jesus. You know, the devil was always trying to do something to Jesus. You know, from birth at Bethlehem, when Herod had all the babies killed, Jesus, of course, escaped. And then through many times during the course of Jesus' ministry, remember they, this verses I always love, they're taking him to the edge of a cliff and they're going to throw him off. And then it says, and Jesus walks through their midst, you know. I think Jesus said, yeah, this isn't the time, let me go, you know. And they had to because whatever he said stuck. But every time there was a situation God provided a way of escape. Another time they were getting ready to stone him. They had dropped the rocks, and Jesus went on, and because it was not his time. And so we see that there was a very much of a confrontation all the time uh, between Jesus and the devils and demons. And places that Jesus would go, literally the demons would cry out at Jesus, and he'd tell the demons to shut up. And uh, so I think Jesus believed in demons, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 4, 29, many uh, demoniacs were brought to him to be freed of evil spirits. In Matthew 9, 16, there was a legion of demons uh, and two men on a hill that came into the pigs. Mary Magdalene had seven demons. In Matthew 9, 32, he cast a demon out of a man who could not speak. At the end of his ministry, he told Peter that he would be sifted like wheat by the devil. In chapter 20 of the book of Revelation comes the final judgment in the lake of the fire for the devil. So there's a lot of references, of course, I didn't mention all of them. 
But sometimes people think there aren't any references. There's, a, there's hundreds of references to the devil and his influence. All this to say is the devil and his demons are real to Jesus, but God's power is much more powerful than the devil. The devil is a created being, but we do not, and we do not need to fear the devil. But a lot of us stay away from even thinking about the devil or thinking about the fact that we're in a battle, and, and if that is so, then the devil has really won the battle for us because the devil is out and about, and he's busy. You know, I, I think about this just this morning. Okay, I come into the church. The fire alarm is going off. There is no, uh, elect, there's no uh, uh, air conditioning in the Sunday school rooms. Uh, there, I had learned from somebody else that they're, they're working on, there was a power outage last night, and so that's why all these things are going on. Then I get up to preach, and even though the green light is on this thing, it does not work. And then, so Todd comes up to help me, you know, and he really doesn't help me, but then they get it to working. <laughs> and, and my, my uh, instead of my, my microphone being right here, it was sticking out that direction. And so the guy from the sound booth, Brad had to come down and adjust me. I felt like I was a Hollywood movie star or something. <laughs> and, but the point is, is that when, if you start talking about the devil, weird things always happen. And... Uh, and so as, as long as we don't deal with the devil, probably everything, he just, everything just goes around pretty well. But when you start dealing with the devil and what the devil is trying to do, things really happen. I remember as, uh, when I was in college, everybody's going to see the movie The Exorcist just because they were freaking out at everything in it. And, uh, and I thought it was a hideous movie. Uh, but I was visiting my aunt just shortly after this in St. Louis, she said, and she says, well, Bobby, uh, do you realize that those, uh, that movie and The Exorcist, that those are, are, are based on what happened at St. Louis University uh, at, at our church here at the hospital? She worked at St. Louis University Hospital in physical therapy. She said there's a big article in the, in the uh, St. Louis newspaper about it, and she showed me this, and that the priest had performed exorcisms on a person that did all the things that were in that movie, that... that you know, it's very interesting. So I was going, really? And then my aunt doesn't even, hard, you know, at that point, she didn't really know the Lord. I was always witnessing to her, but she was bringing up these topics to me uh, out of the newspaper. A short term, uh, just a short time later, I brought a, a friend with a lot of quirks and strange things about him. I brought him to the youth meeting. And uh, at our youth meetings at the time, we always, you know, we're always witnessing, always, uh, you know, leading people to Christ. And so, I got them together afterwards with my mentor, Richard Beach, and uh, so Richard explained the Lord to him, and he, he was very, I was just shocked that he was so interested in God, you know, uh, and so he said, well, would you like to pray now and receive Christ? And he goes, he goes, start shaking his head, yes, but at the same time, he'd broken out in a sweat. His eyes were kind of circling around in his head, and he could not speak the words of receiving Christ. His, his lips were tight like this. Richard asked me if he wanted to receive Christ, and he, and, he, and he nodded his head like this, but word, the words literally could not come out of the man's mouth. And so I'm going, whoa, this is, this is a weird situation. And so Richard Beach says, uh, puts his hands, do you mind if I pray for him? And he goes like this. So Richard starts praying for him, and he says, I pray that this evil spirit would leave, leave him now, or whatever is binding him from receiving Christ, and as soon as he said those words, and as soon as he said the words in the name of Jesus Christ, my buddy just went limp, and then he prayed and received Jesus Christ right like that. Okay, well, the next day we, have, we, we would have testimonies if, if people came to Christ, you know? And so he gets up and he says, well, last night uh, I, re I received Jesus Christ, and everybody's clapping, and he says, and it was really an unusual situation because uh, Richard here prayed for me, and the demons left me, and then I received Christ. And, I, and Richard and I were like going at each other. What? Like we didn't understand that there were demons that had left him, but he understood that there were demons that had left him. So we were kind of we were kind of a bit freaked out by the whole situation. Uh, you know, because we we yeah we did believe in demons, but we didn't you know we like didn't deal with them on a regular basis. I'll just put it that way. So uh, two months later, 
we got the motorcycle gang who I mentioned in the house, and uh, we're trying to lead them to Christ. And all of a sudden, one of the guys just hits me as hard as he can right in my face and declares that I was preaching Jesus, which is the very thing that a demon might do. And, and then he, his next words are, I'm going to kill you, Leilighter. And so he is coming at me, and I just, I look at this guy, and the devil was just in the man's eyes. And, uh, and I, as, I, as I'm thinking, you know, about it now, retrospectively, you know, I, I, in that year period of time, had a crash course in demonology because they, they were out there. Well, I didn't think I would, uh, the course would expand a couple weeks later, but it did. I went to the house of a wealthy stockbroker for a prayer meeting. His name's Harv Newland. Maybe some of you would know him in Mission Hills. And uh, I was always very impressed by him because he was so Christ-like and he's a very cool player. He's a great tennis player and very rich. And uh, so he began, it was a prayer meeting, so I was just over at the, his house, you know, and he began the pr- prayer meeting by saying, someone here tonight has a demon in them. And I'm, going, I'm getting a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and then within one minute, he starts casting the demon out of this guy. And this guy's shrieking, he's moaning, and then finally the demon leaves him and he's just as calm as can be. Give him a drink of water and... It's just like nothing ever happened, you know. But, uh, you know, with all this in mind today as I'm coming to you, as we read this passage of the spiritual struggle, you know, I don't have any doubts that the devil and his, and his legions of demons are alive and well in Johnson County and Jackson Counties. People need soul healing and deliverance from evil forces. Our scripture this morning tells us to be strong in the Lord which is the best way to resist these things, to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, which means you have to have an understanding, a certain amount of his schemes. Stand firm in putting on the armor of God. You you need protection. And to pray at all times that the gospel would go forth with boldness, because that's ultimately what Satan wants to stop, is the gospel going forward. So how are we to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might? Uh, The only way to overcome the devil is to be regularly in God's word, prayer, and walking by faith, by the Spirit of God. I believe few people are actually possessed by demons, um, and most of the the devil's efforts are in more subtle ways. I also believe that we as Christians cannot be possessed by demons, but sometimes are oppressed by them or bothered by them in some ways. Oftentimes, uh, people deal these, uh, you know, blow these situations out of proportion, But uh, it's like this morning and these different things that were happening in the church. You know, the devil wants to confuse. That's one of his things that he works with, confusion. And that confusion can be around us. But you know what what really happens is many of us give the devil the opportunity through the the way we think, through the things that we're involved in, through moving toward and away, away from God in different areas and addictions that we might have that give the devil a foothold and an opportunity to take over in our lives. You know, our human efforts really fail in doing anything against the devil. Uh, I love and I've always loved uh, this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 19. It's the seven sons of Sceva. These guys tried to cast demons out with Jesus' name, but they were Jewish and they didn't know Jesus. And so it backfired on them because the demon said, we know we know Jesus and we know Paul, but we don't know you. And they, and they attacked, the seven sons of Sceva were attacked by these demons and beat up and sent running down the road, which I always thought was very funny, kind of funny, yeah, actually a funny story as the demons beat them up. But, uh, you know, I think around us, we, we do live in a world that, that is involved in occult practices and we need to point people to Christ. Uh, a girl I met had these two demons and she liked the power that they had. She was on her way to the high priest, the satanic worshipers. She threatened me with the demons in her. And I told her what we need to do any time we think about Satan and his power. I told her that he who is in me is more powerful than he who is in you. She said in disgust that she knew that and just couldn't even look me in the eye. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, and against world forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, to be good at wrestling, 
you have to be good in tech, you know, in wrestling as a sport. You need to be good in your techniques. You need to be aggressive. You need to be defensive. You need to study your opponent's weaknesses. And we too need to be good at technique, in aggressiveness, defense, and the study of our opponent, the devil. Uh, you know, and another thing, when you're really implementing your defense system and you're wrestling with the evil one, you need to practice your faith. You need to practice getting out there and opening up your mouth for Jesus Christ. You know, to help somebody on their journey with Jesus Christ, it takes a lot of preparation on our, on our parts. Uh, we need to think about how we might deal with different arguments. And it doesn't happen as we just read a book. Sharing Christ is something that happens as you are, put yourself out on the line to share the good news of Jesus Christ and begin often through trial and error to know how to best communicate the good news through your style. Standing firm against the schemes of the devil, it's important to, to first realize the reality of his power and, and, and watching for the way that he has pull in our lives and the ways that sometimes we give him those pull, that pull. Scripture calls us to be on the alert as his plots unfold. Often it's through things that just come out of the blue and overwhelm you. Uh, it can happen even in a conversation with your wife when suddenly uh, there, there's a little, you have a little tension and all of a sudden each, each of the couples intensify that. We receive crazy distractions uh, that kill the spirit. Uh, I, I know there was a time that we had at, in my Young Life Club, we had about 250 people in, in the basement. And uh, the gospel was being preached, and there was a commitment was asked for by the students. And just as that commitment was being asked for, the phone had rung upstairs, and the, the father of the house had a booming voice, and he was, in a, he was a big time in the coal industry, and he was arguing with somebody on the phone and yelling at the top of his lungs upstairs <laughs> while we were trying to see these young people come to Christ. And I, I, I went up there and said, yeah, could you kind of tone it down, please? And so he was, he was a little embarrassed about that. But later then, many people did respond and receive Jesus Christ. And here again, this is something I've learned over time, that when you're getting close to seeing when come, someone actually come to Christ, something will happen right at that moment that will be a distraction that will uh, take you away. And... Uh, you know, another thing that I have seen about Satan and his attacks, if you are really living for Jesus Christ, you are going to be attacked. You know, he, the devil doesn't need to worry about someone who's not, you know, not, not out there in the fort, you know, not doing anything. He, he's worried about people who actually are. And uh, I was thinking about one of the young men in our church that I've known actually since he was in second grade. And many of you would know the name Wilcher. His name's Todd Wilcher. And Todd was on our summer staff a couple summers, and, and I knew him all the way through. He was in a Bible study with me in high school days, and, and uh, then he went on to be a lawyer, and he, he was always helping me as a lawyer uh, to defend all my people in the inner city. He would, always, he would always, you know, just do it for free, just represent whoever, whatever thug I had. He would, he would try and help him. And... I really appreciated that about him. Then he became the prosecuting attorney in Kansas City, Missouri. And then most recently, he became a judge in Kansas City. And he is one of the fairest yet to the point guys I've ever known and very righteous in his approach, but always fair. And well, yesterday, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, a lady was in his courtroom who's known as a real agitator. And she started just screaming in the top of her lungs in the courtroom. Now, if you've ever been in a courtroom, you do not scream in the courtroom. You know, all of us normal people know that. But she just thought she could do it because she was herself. And she kept doing it. And, and he, he's very calm. And he just said, you know, we don't have this in the courtroom. Would you please sit down or I'm going to have to have you removed. And so she just kept doing it. And so he called and had her removed from the courtroom. And then ever since then, she's been completely distorting the story, putting in the star, all these different things. Well, the election is coming up for judge. You know, you check the box. And almost all the time, we always check our, our boxes and say, the judge is fine, or we don't really know anything about the judge. Now, so she's gotten this word out about how, what a bad judge he is, when he's probably, the, when, when all his peers look at him as the best judge. He's, he's had 30,000 cases, 
and never has had to eject anybody from the courtroom. To get, that just gives you an idea of what it's like. So pray for him, but I, I'm just telling you that here's a guy that has wanted to do what is right and just and has been doing it. He's in the housing courts in the state of Missouri. And I won't tell you how to check the box if you're from Missouri or if you want to tell your friends about it, but you may let your conscience be your guide in, uh, for Todd. Or if all you can do is just pray for him because he's, he is a, certainly a good man. And we need good, good people in justice positions, don't we, that will judge fairly. And we want that. You got a guy in there and, and all of his peers and everybody else think he's the best. And anyway, that is what happens to you if you really stand for righteousness. Isn't that what happened to Jesus? Okay, he was crucified. Well, this is what's happening by this one lady to Todd. Todd's given us protection against the attacks of Satan. He uses the Roman armor of the day to be symbolic of the armor that God gives us to protect ourselves against the evil one. Because the, de- the evil one is always looking for the places that we're most vulnerable. But we rem- need to remember to put on that armor daily with prayer. The first instruction is to gird your loins with the belt of truth. The belt held the, the sword, equipment, and also the long skirts that oftentimes they wore, particularly in the colder regions, uh, to keep warm. During battle, they would, they would tie their, their long skirts up so they could move freely and not trip. The belt of truth for us is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him we find truth. And so Jesus needs to be at the very center of our defense against the battle plan of the devil. And he's a very strong uh, leader. It's the very center of the battlements that we need to have. It's important to remember that Christ is our sufficiency. The second is the blessed breastplate of righteousness. The, the idea of the, the, the breastplate to uh, make it so that you couldn't be uh, killed by someone striking your heart the, the thing that preserves us is Christ's righteousness, which, help, which helps us guards our heart from the immoral activities around us that would draw this, them in or following the other gods of this world. The devil does want to get hold of our hearts. In Proverbs it says, above all things, guard your hearts for from it flow the issues of life. The third thing we should have is our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Roman soldiers wore protective gear with spikes at the bottom that could hope, help them hold their position and hold their ground in battle. We must be prepared uh, to hold our ground in battle spiritually, and we need to be prepared with the gospel of the good news to be able to share with other peoples. We need to, to understand how to deal with different peoples and in different ways in communicating the good news. Remember these trainings as being local links as an opportunity for you to improve uh, on your uh, preparation for the gospel of peace. And as Todd had alluded to, there, there's one coming up on the 23rd at, at 6 and, and on the 27th at 8.30 and on the 28th at 9. So you can see those in the lobby. The fourth is wielding the strong shield of faith for protection the fiery, against the fiery arrows of the evil one. You know, the devil does come at us and fiery in, in, when we least expect it in these un, unusual ways, like a fiery arrow that would just be coming through the air and you wouldn't even know where it was coming from when it hit. And the shields were very important. They were uh, leather and, and put in the water so that they could extinguish those flaming arrows as they came their way. The shield of faith is the most important, one of the most important things that we can do, is, and that's trusting fully in Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. We never know what the devil have, has up a sleeve. Our faith gives us eyes to see the attacks and protection uh, <clears throat> from even when we can't see them coming. Our ability to use <clears throat> our shield of faith grows in the midst of trial and grows in our ability to trust Christ through the word of God and the faithful examples of fellow Christians around us. The fifth is the helmet of salvation, protecting uh, your brain, obviously. Knowing with assurance, and what that is for us is that salvation for us is, is knowing with assurance that we have Christ in our lives and that we're indwe- being indwelled by God's Spirit. Keeping Christ's identity growing in our lives as we realize all that we have in Jesus Christ. 
You know, the, the sad thing is that many people that come to church are not, have, have some, some have little assurance of their salvation. They're, if they were to die today, they're not sure. It's, it's something to go visit, as Todd had mentioned, Dave Unruh, one of our, our most wonderful members, as he's facing death. And, and I was in the room when he, he was kind of saying his last words to his wife before they put him, put him under, anesthetized him, and, and uh, so he couldn't speak anymore. And uh, his last words were, well, I didn't expect that I would go out this way, but if this is the way God wants it, it's fine with me, I'll see him soon. And if not, I'll, I'll, I'll hang on as long as I can. And that's kind of that's was his, his, his attitude. What, what will your attitude be on that day that you're facing uh, death? His was the confidence in Jesus Christ. But I, I can guarantee you that I've done funerals of people uh, who, who we haven't, maybe even family members of people in our congregation, who we haven't encouraged enough to really commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And so they have... Uh, they do not have that helmet of salvation. You know, when you're confident in your faith, it helps you to overcome a lot of things. The assurance of Christ in your mind gives you peace. It's a foundation to build on. Without it, we're easy prey to the enemy. And, and living in fear instead of living in the confidence we have in Jesus. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. I know for me, when I was assured of my salvation, it was a big step in going forward uh, to be a minister for Jesus Christ. The sixth is the sword of the Spirit, the mighty power of God. It's the word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword able to cut through the joint and the marrow. The sword is an offensive weapon to use in attacks against the devil, but it's also a defensive weapon, giving us the ability to parry off the blows of the evil one and counter him with a mortal wound. I always remember that Jesus fought the devil with Scripture. It's that Scripture, the Word of God that's in our heart that helps us uh, go against the devil. It's, it's the Scripture that reminds us of what is right and what is proper. And so always uh, make the Word of God uh, a daily uh, tool in your arsenal. The armor must be put on with prayer and is more and more developed within us over time. We are to pray, as it says in this scripture today, at all times. We're to pray in the spirit. We're to pray with perseverance. And we're to pray to proclaim the gospel with boldness. If we're real soldiers of Jesus Christ and God's army, we must be in prayer regularly for others. Uh, next week, we're going to be given some cards. They're card uh, of, a, of a program that we're using called Operation Andrew. And uh, so... You'll be given those next week. And, and the basic gist of Operation Andrew, you remember, Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. And so, brother, the Andrew program that we're talking about is, is us bringing other people to Jesus. And so on the card, you'll have a place to list five friends that you'd like to, we'd like you to begin to pray for and share Christ with. First, by building a friendship, listening to them and caring for their needs through acts of kindness looking for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with them, finally inviting them to church or World Impact events, September 25th through October 18th. When you're around your friends, be praying for an opportunity to share Christ. Remember, it's God's job to win them to himself. And don't be offended when people turn you down because it's not over until it's over. Be persistent. God is calling all us to be more bold and more persistent in our seeking out people for Jesus Christ. One other thing that I had as I was thinking about various types of prayers, I, we find in Isaiah 58, 6 through 8, that it's by prayer and fasting that you can loosen the bonds of wickedness, undo the bands of the yoke, and let the oppressed go free. Um, and so that is how we limit the devil's power and open doors for ministry. So if you have a particularly hard problem that you know is a, the spirit of evil is upon it, uh, I think fasting is a very important tool in your arsenal of specialized prayer. As we conclude today, I pray for all of us as we can really completing this, this series that we'll take a lot of time to consider and think about our position in Christ and all that we have in Christ. That, and moment by moment, 
we will be drawing closer to him sitting at his feet. I hope that you'll walk in, not in the ways of the world but under the, and under the power of the devil, but instead to walk in the works that God has prepared for you beforehand since the beginning of time, to walk in a worthy manner, to walk in love, light, and the care filled uh, with his Holy Spirit. And finally, that you'd stand firm against the plots of the devil, putting the full armor of God on, filled with his spirit, boldly giving witness to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us to stand firm in you. And uh, I, I just think in my mind's eyes, I'm even praying that, the Roman lines that just stood firm and they just would march slowly forward, uh, overcoming the enemy. But it was that standing firm that made them so invincible, uh, locking their shields and going forward. I pray that we, like those Roman soldiers, would go forward in our world, locking our shields together and uh, helping people uh, to die to themselves and rise in Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you for this opportunity we've had today to think about these things, to recognize that there's an evil one around us that uh, does not want us to succeed uh, in anything we do. Uh, And so I pray that you would give us the full armor of God, that we would stand firm against the evil one. In Jesus' name, amen.